if you've been saved, you have the power of the Holy Spirit. You're indwelled by the Spirit. In that indwelling, you have the exousia. You have the legal authority to carry out the same duties and responsibilities that Jesus did. And this is, this is, when, he, this is when he says, greater works than I will you do. He expects us to do greater works. Not greater than he, but greater works. Through what? The exousia of the indwelling Holy Spirit. And part of that is, as Mark tells us in 16, and I'll read this, later he appeared to the eleven as they sat at the table. And he rebuked their unbelief and hardness of heart because they did not believe those who had seen him after he had risen. So let's be clear. This is after the crucifixion, the resurrection. And he said to them, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. That means everything. Speak the power of God to everything. And he who believes and is baptized will be saved. But he who does not believe will be condemned. And these signs will follow those who believe. Now, these are the signs. In my name, they will cast out demons. You are expected to cast out demons. If you're not comfortable with it, then that's why we're an equipping church to get you there. Okay? Um, they will cast out. They will speak with new tongues. They will take up serpents, and if they drink anything deadly, it will by no means hurt them. They will lay hands on the sick, and they will, and they will, and they will recover. Not they might, or they may, and they will recover. This is why it's so important that you have the Holy Spirit, that you're operating with the legal authority that Jesus has given you to act on your behalf, His behalf. You've been deputized to go out and do the work that Jesus came to do. So, I want you to really understand and take that serious. You know, even in this secular-driven, demonic world, when officers take an oath, when they receive their commission, they still put their hand on the Bible and they swear to an oath. Now, whether it means anything to them or not, it's that important. The commissioning is that important. There's a training, there's an equipping, there's an educating. And, the, and the, the discipleship model is come, see, do. Jesus says, follow me. Let's follow him. See how I do it. The third part is the, it's the education model, do. It does no good if we don't do the do. And this is the beauty of, of being an equipping church. There, I really want you to, to place a demand on your, on your soul to really receive that power, understand the authority that you have. So what I want to make sure that we understand too is you look at this scripture and the first thing that he says, if you could back up one, is, and he's, what does is, what is Jesus say? Go into all the world, go, sent, apostolo, in the Greek, apostolic, that means to be sent as a messenger, so go, and preach the gospel, the word of God. Now go to the next thing. Before the signs, you've got to have what? The word. You've got to have the word of God before the signs will follow. I will tell you so many people, either believers or, or whatever state they think they're in, they go looking for what we call the woo-woo. They go looking for the, for, the, for the shiny. They're looking for the wonder. They want to go to the prophetic ministries where, they, where, they're, where they're knocked out, slain in the Spirit. But, they, but it takes the Word first before you'll see the signs. If you're trying to minister as Sceva's seven sons did, and you come up against the demon, and the demon realizes you don't know the word because you don't know who is the word. Mm. One demon took seven of those boys. And what did they do? They ran out of the house naked and bleeding. If you don't think that set the, the, the social media channels ablaze, but that's what happens if you don't know the word of God and you launch into a, a, a I don't want to say counterfeit, but you, you self-launch. 
into a ministry or you try to uh, you try to heal and you're like well nothing's happening like nothing's Jesus said mm. first he said the word if you're having an issue where you don't feel so the excusia you have that but then there's two different types of power the dunamis which is the internal power the power of the Holy Spirit the righteousness that that redeems you and then in that dunamis through the exousia you get the kratos power that's the outward demonstrable power of the Holy Spirit. That is the power that when the 600 elite warriors came to arrest Jesus in the garden, and Jesus says, who are you looking for? Jesus, that's me. And what did they do? It said they fell out as if dead. That's the Kratos power. That is the Kratos power, the outward demonstrable. Last week, a young girl came up at the end and asked me to pray for her. And, and I, so I prayed, and the Holy Spirit revealed. And, and then she went out in the Holy Spirit. She went out on the power as an as outward demonstrable power of Kratos power. This is where you've got to have the Word first. Then you have the Kratos power. Practical worldview, they go through the police academy first. Then they have the authority to exercise in the commission. This is what we're doing on Wednesday nights. This is the equipping this is your special forces training opportunity to learn. You want to heal? You should. Why? Because Jesus says we're supposed to. You want to know how to heal? You get equipped. Because Jesus said, come, see, do. So what I will tell you is that also the ministering of healing and deliverance, you've got to be locked into God's word. You've got to be locked into God's word. Uh, a lot of people will try to minister from their experience. Well, this is how it happened for me. That's great, but it's not a cookie cutter. Jesus will meet you where you are. So you got to focus on what does the Word say. Once you know the Word, the signs will follow. They have to follow because Jesus says that they'll follow. So the one thing that I want to share with you is that Jesus Christ heals both body and soul, revealing His authority over sin, offering us the ultimate healing through salvation. So I know it's, it's, and I'm going to watch myself. I have sometimes maybe a slant to talk about the physical healing, but the more important is, is someone's soul, someone's salvation, okay? Um, so what I'm going to jump in and out of is from Luke, um, Luke 5. So the first thing I want to talk about is the healing power of faith. And so Luke 5, 17, 20, and I'll read it to you. Then behold... Men brought on a bed a man who was paralyzed, whom they sought to bring in and lay before him. They're talking about Jesus. And when they could not find uh, how that they might bring him because of the crowd. My reading is so weird. I don't have my glasses. They went up on the housetop and led him down uh, with his bed through the tiling into the midst before Jesus. So I've asked you guys before, who's in your five? Who's in your five? It's a sociological construct that you will become the aggregate of the five people you surround yourself with. If you want to be a knucklehead, hang out with five knuckleheads. You want to be a millionaire, hang out with five millionaires. Um, you will become the aggregate reflection of the five people that you're closest to. So when most people say, well, I don't have any friends, I don't really have anybody. Well, you got the Father, you've got the Son, and you've got the Holy Spirit. So that's a pretty good start. That's a good spark. So what we need to do, and if we don't have those people in our life, pray. Pray with an expectation that God's going to bring roof-ripping people into your life. If you don't have friends that will rip the roof off to get you to Jesus, you need more people. And I know, because I know everyone, we are those roof-ripping people. And that is so important. So I do, I thank you for your commitment, but I also encourage you. There's so many people in this world that need to be physically brought to Jesus, physically picked up on Sunday mornings and carried to church, physically because they're unable to do it or unwilling sometimes to do it themselves. Be a roof ripper for your friends and for the kingdom. With the example of these old boys, it shows also the communal faith and coming into agreement, the impact it can have on people's lives. 
You know, when, we're, when we do our corporate prayers on Sunday morning, we break into small groups. And, 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 and some people, oh, I don't like that. I'm more introverted, you know. But you know, it's important that we come together. Why? Because the Bible says come together and pray for one another. The power of communal faith. Build your faith. So don't allow anybody, like this paralytic, don't allow anybody to stop you from coming to Jesus. His friends, they got creative because they stayed persistent. You know, I think about the, the, the cripple at the pool of Bethesda in John 5. He'd been laying there for 38 years. For 38 years. And Jesus the Christ walks up to him and he says what? Do you want to be well? Do you want to be healed? And what did that old boy say? Do you know what I've been through? Do you know what I've been through? I will tell you that there's believers that don't walk in their authority, that their affliction has become their identity. I want to tell you and encourage you, not just for us, but for when you start hearing people talk about my depression, my this, my cancer, my divorce, my debt, that is not yours. You were not created with that. You reject that. Do not speak those words over your life. Do not speak those words. So when Jesus the Christ himself walks up and says, hey, you want to be well? You know what I've been through? Check yourself and make sure. I was, I was talking to a, one of the guys that I'm discipling. We were talking about, man, I'm, just, I'm almost healed. I'm almost fully delivered. And I said, is it like a box of crayons? And you've gotten rid of the 24, but there's those two. And you hear them rattling but you really don't want to look in the box because you're kind of afraid of what color they might be. They might be like taupe and sepia. So you leave them in there. What I want to encourage you is don't leave no crayons in the box. If there's anything rattling in your spirit, if there's anything rattling in your soul, seek soul care. So seek deep inner healing. It's the only way you're going to walk in your true uh, believer's authority. So let's go to uh, Luke 17, 20. This is 20. When he saw their faith, this is Jesus talking about the old boys that let him down. He said to him, man, your sins are forgiven you. What I will tell you is faith is the key to accessing God's po uh, power. That is the key to accessing God's power. And look, sometimes you don't even, you don't even feel it. I love the dad back in the book of Mark. I believe but help my unbelief. That is probably the one of the most honest statements said by anybody other than Jesus throughout the whole Bible. I will tell you that, that when we don't feel like, I, I, I want to be faithful, but I just don't feel faithful. Well, number one, if you're letting your feelings dictate your level of faithfulness, you're being led by the soul instead of the spirit. So get off the solar coaster and focus back on the word of the Lord. But your faith is the key to accessing God's power. You see, Jesus responds to faith. He doesn't respond to begging and crying and the fact that you're a pretty good guy. That stuff don't cut it. I was sharing, I, I, I teach actually our sons um, before, before tonight. We come early and I, I teach them a Bible study and, and really explaining to them the, the, the a believer's authority. And that it's so important that from every age that we learn to walk in that authority. And so this is part of, this is part of what Jesus is doing. It takes that faith to activate that authority. So let me ask you, in this passage that we read, so kind of what stands out to you in this passage? The big crowds, the friends, the paralytic, um, or maybe the, the fact that Jesus addressed his sins before he addressed his physical affliction. And so I want to tell you why he does that. Is the reason that Jesus, he first forgave the sins before the healing. It's spiritual healing first. Spiritual healing first. Jesus prioritizes the man's spiritual condition over his physical ailment. Now, I've got it in a note further down, but the Lord said to share it now. I want to encourage when we're ministering to people, and we've all, we've all done altar ministry. We do healing, deliverance, prophetic. How many times do you start off with, unless it's somebody we know, 
Um, have you received Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? Or they walk up and they say, I got a bunion on my toe. And we drop on our knees, we start praying over that toe. I want to encourage you, take time, pump the brakes, invest in their spiritual welfare. Make sure that they've received Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. Their salvation is going to have a lot longer benefits than the bunion on the toe. And I learned this my wife. I would, I would help people with, with, with uh, marriage, marriage counseling. We do that. And, and I would give all the spiritual advice in the world. Scripture and do 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 do. And Leah's like, are they even believers? I don't know. You mean you didn't ask them? No. No, I didn't ask them. Then what you're saying to them means nothing. It means nothing. You're speaking a foreign language. I want to encourage the first thing when people come for healing is to check their spiritual health. Make sure that they're believers. Uh, we've done it. We've done a, a, a renunciation a, a week or so ago, a group of us, and, and we, are, we are walking through um, repentance and confession. We are getting their, their spiritual health where it needs to be. The next reason that Jesus did this instead of healing them first, physically healing, is the authority to forgive sins. Jesus was showing his declaration of forgiveness uh, demonstrates his divine authority. Because you see, the, the Pharisees, and they were watching. They were always watching. So it was important for Jesus to establish his authority to be able to do this. Uh, Luke 5, 24, I have, but they, and he said, but they may know that the Son of Man has power on earth to forgive sins. He said to the man who was paralyzed, I say to you, arise, take up your bed, and go to your house. It was because Jesus had the authority to forgive sins that he was able to move to the next step of the physical manifestation of healing. So I encourage you when we're ministering to people, when we're praying for people, um, like I know we want to get in and we want to see somebody stand up from a wheelchair. We want cancer cast out. But make sure we first address their spiritual state. And before you go up for healing, make sure that, or many ministry, but make sure that you're in a state. The, Greek, the Hebrew word is teshuva. It means to, to return to the original state. Repentance. Repentance. Teshuva. If before you come up for healing, make sure that you've got a clean vessel within which the Holy Spirit can pour into just some, just some personal advice. Holistic healing. Another reason that Jesus did the spiritual care before the physical care was uh, Jesus' approach is to show that he cares about the whole person. The whole person. The soul, the body, and then now the, the spirit. When we minister to people, the same thing. Let's make sure, because you can. You can get so impersonal that it becomes a production. It becomes a show. It's like somebody goes out under the power of the Holy Spirit underneath your touch. Yeah. So is it about you or is it about King Jesus? That is a great way to, to make sure that we stay in alignment. So talking about the, the, the holistic approach, I just want to remind you that when we get into a healing posture or we go for healing, that we're dealing with three parts of the, of the who we are. That's First uh, Thessalonians 5.23. Now may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely, that may your whole spirit, your whole soul, and body be preserved blameless at the coming of our Lord Christ. You are, we, I, we are a three-part being. You've got your physical body, and we do. We focus on the physical manifestation of healing, but we've also got the soul, and that's your personality, your mind. Your, it's what makes you you. And then your spirit. And the Spirit, when you're saved, is the Holy Spirit. So when Leah tells me, uh, you're not perfect, I'm like, well, one-third of me is because I got the 100% righteousness of the Holy Spirit living inside of me, right? So when we're ministering healing, I just want you to realize and really pay attention that take the holistic approach. Take the holistic approach. Are you saved? Have you received Jesus Christ, your Lord and Savior? Uh, no. Well, I've got some good news for you. Let's address that. Or if it's, yes, I have. Cool. But focus, I will tell you, when I was ministering to this, this young girl uh, last week, she came up with a physical ailment, ailment. But as I began to pray, the Holy Spirit said, uh, minister to her heart. 
minister to her heart. So now I'm ministering to her soul. And of course, that, that did manifest in physical healing for her body. So I'm just, I'm just encouraging as we do minister to one another, or we come up for healing ministry, um, come with the expectation that the whole body, the, the soul, of course, the spirit's perfect, the soul and the body get the care that they need. And, and what I want to encourage you to is remind you, is Jesus is showing that he's not, he's not a one area ministry specialist. You know, I hear people like, well, I've got a healing ministry. I've got a delivery ministry. I've got a prophetic ministry. I've got this ministry. No, really what you need to do is what Acts tells us in 2027. For I have not shunned to declare to you the whole counsel of God. This book, from, from the first to the last, this is the counsel of God. This is what we've got to minister. You know, I've shared, I've shared with some people back when I worked undercover for 12 years. And my job was to find drugs and violent criminals and all that. So if I stop somebody who was drunk, I'm like, you ain't got no drugs in here? No, but I can't even see the road in front of me. I'm like, get on out of here. You ain't got no drugs. Get on down the road. And cops do that. People do that in their specialty. Homicide detectives, I got no dead body. You can keep growing. We're not called to be specialists in the kingdom. And, and which we know, if, you do, uh, if you're going to do healing deliverance, a lot of your healing deliverance comes from deliverance. From deliverance. When Jesus would cast out a demonic spirit, then there would be physical healing. So I want, to encourage, I want to stretch you. I want to stretch you. If you're like, man, I'm really comfortable with, with prophetic ministry. That's great. That's a gift. That's a muscle. You developed it well. It's like a high school kid in the gym on summer break. They developed their biceps really well. But little, little bitty, bitty legs. Let's not be that. Let's work on learning and ministering the full counsel of God and becoming equipped in every area. Okay? Because this is what Jesus did. So let's go to the next step. Is spiritual healing versus physical healing. So Luke 5, 21 says, And the scribes and the Pharisees began to reason, saying, Who is this? Who speaks blasphemies? Who can forgive sins but God alone? Now when it says that they reasoned in the Greek, it is a crazy long word. I'm not even going to try to say it. But it means to reason is to make a settlement of accounts. What they were doing, they were coming up with a story. We've seen them do it a lot. They were reasoning. They were coming up with a story. So they're seeing the Christ. They're seeing the, the prophesied Messiah operating in the full power. But they don't want to receive it because their hearts have become so hardened. So what do they do? What a lot of people do. They begin to dismiss the truth of the word of the, of the Lord. You see, and what they did was they're trying to create a false narrative. They didn't share the faith. They didn't share the understanding of the blessings and the experiencing the miraculous. What I encourage you is to really understand that you are the miraculous. You are the miraculous. Think about it. If you have received Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you are so supernatural. You've got the living God inside of you. You have not a little Holy Spirit. He don't give it out in doses. You've got the 100% righteousness of God through the Holy Spirit living inside of you. A couple years ago, I was, I was teaching on a Sunday, and man, the Holy Spirit got a hold of me, and, and I got so angry about people. Well, I'm only human. I'm only human. And I thought, what a, what a discredit to the power of God living inside of them. Because when you receive the Holy Spirit, friends, you're no longer just human. You're supernatural. And there's an expectation with that. These guys, they reject that. But even though they're coming up with a false narrative, like a lot of the world does, what did Jesus do? He remained focused on the mission. He was not going to be distracted or detracted by the naysayers. What I'm asking you is keep your eyes on Jesus. Keep your eyes on the cross. Stay focused on the mission. There's going to be, always going to be disturbance in the atmosphere. But look, even if it feels like you're not doing it right or you don't feel you're ministering to somebody and you're like, oh, I got to come up with some fancier words. I don't know what I'm doing. Man, you don't need fancy words. You just need the word of the Lord. You need God's word. That brings healing. It brings transformation. 
You go further than that, you turn into performance because you're looking for a product. I share with you guys, and, and I, believe, I believe this is for, for two people in here tonight. I'm going um, to share. So a couple years ago, I've shared this before, but this is the Lord is saying there's two people that he wants, to, he wants them to accept this. Um, I shared. I'm from South Louisiana. We tell a lot of stories because there's not a lot of things to do on the bayou, so we make up a lot of stories. And, and so undercover, I had to be a good storyteller. My life depended on it for 12 years. And so when I began to, to teach, as the Lord called me to do, my natural gift is talking a lot. Leah says, I talk till I pass out of sleep, and the second I wake up, I'm talking. She's like, what could you possibly have to say after being asleep for eight hours? I got a lot to say. But you know what the Lord said? He goes, I don't need you saying a lot. So he gave me a one-word ministry, and that word is shalom. And I probably prayed that over a lot of y'all. What the Lord was showing to me, showing me, is he can do more with him, with less of me. He doesn't need me to convince you that you're healed. He doesn't need me to talk the demon out of you. He just simply needs me to speak the word that the Holy Spirit gives me. So I don't know who that's for. And if I asked him, he would tell me. But I believe this is for two people. Maybe you're struggling in your ministry. You're really not sure. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to encourage that to, to adopt that mantle of a one-word ministry. Let the Lord show you that he will do more when you say less. Shalom. 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 If you want to minister to, to soul care, inner peace, that word is transformational. It is transformational. So while healing, while physical healing is important, Spiritual healing, which is the freedom from sin and the restoration to God, is far more powerful and eternal. That bunion, I can live with a bunion, but I don't want to live without sozo. I don't want to live knowing that I will always be in the presence of God. When we minister to people, have that burden. Have that burden. Is it fun to watch somebody get up from an ailment? Or Yeah, it is. It encourages your faith. But let's make sure we don't overlook the bigger picture to make sure they're saved. And if they've received salvation, then let's minister to the soul. There's a lot of people that come into this church. The Lord told us years ago that we're to be a safe harbor. And it's weird because we're, we're supposed to be a warrior culture. We're warring for the kingdom, but we're supposed to be a, a safe harbor. We're supposed to be there to protect people when they've just been flat worn out by the demonic world, and the cutthroat culture of Christianity. So we focus on soul care as much as physical healing. You know, the paralytic, his, man, uh, his healing, it shows the balance that Jesus had in healing his body, but only after addressing his deeper need for spiritual wholeness. So this is, this is it's turning out to be a, a more of an equipping of how to minister healing, but it also goes for us when we receive healing. Come with an expectation. Where does that expectation come from? Faith. With the faith to believe that you are healed and that through the ministry or through your own, that you can manifest, the, the healing can be manifested through your faith. But don't neglect the soul care that you may need, the inner healing. So, um, so I do. I have a note here. It says, before you launch into ministry healing, uh, take the time to invest in the person. And that is always a good practice. Now, if it's the same person that comes up three weeks in a row, and <laughs> either, you know, there may be other issues, but, but always care for the holistic person instead of launching in. And, and I'll tell you something practical. I told him we were years ago when she started um, deliverance and ministry, and, and, and she was praying for a person in the, in the store, like a Kroger or something, a young person. And, and so she started praying and she, she, you know, she got her eyes closed. She's all up in her, in her area and she starts praying. She goes, I hear a growl. This person started to manifest, started to growl. And I'm like, she goes, so what, like, what do you do? I said, well, first, keep your eyes open. Keep your eyes open. Right? When you're ministering to someone, keep your eyes open. 
That's just a little, that's a little land yet, what we call down on the bayou. That means free. Uh, didn't cost you nothing. So I got a question. Are there areas in your life where you're experiencing, um, where you have experienced spiritual healing, but maybe you're still waiting on physical healing? Because it can be complex, I will tell you. It can be complex when you truly believe that you're healed, but you're waiting and you've not seen it yet. And maybe you just don't understand. What I will tell you is this is where you press in. This is where you persevere. This is where you learn to trust God's timing. What you do is you go to the Word. You find yourself some scriptures and you put them on your phone. So, for example, Isaiah 40, 31. But those who wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles, and they shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. Get yourself some core scriptures that speak to yourself. We don't always have to call the pastor and the elder and, and this one and that one. All we're going to do is give you the same words that come from the same book. So get yourself some scripture. The other thing, when you're waiting on God's timing for that physical manifestation of healing, is prayer and fellowship with other believers. Prayer and fellowship with other believers. I was telling Leah today when I did martial arts for a long, long time, and then I got out for a bit, and, and they're like, when are you coming back? Man, when I get in shape. Well, how do you get in shape for martial arts? By doing martial arts. How do you, how do you grow your faith, your perseverance? You press into prayer and a body of believers. So many people isolate themselves. And that, well, when I get better, I'm going to come back. When I get my life straightened out, I'm going to come back. Well, it's because you're gone is the reason that your life's not straightened out. Don't, don't neglect gathering with the saints. Also, when you're, in that, when you're in that season of waiting, share your struggles and your victories with other believers. This reminds you that you're not alone, and it builds their faith. When the Lord talks about, when the Lord talks about uh, iron ver sharpens iron, that is a clashing, a clashing, a clashing of like metal. It is a very violent, forceful action. It is so important to be with other believers. And, and you know, I always say, if you're going to climb the Himalayas, find yourself a Sherpa. Find yourself someone who's already been up that mountain. You can, you can always try to reinvent the wheel, but you're going to find yourself circling the mountain for 40 years in wilderness. Find yourself a Sherpa. You're struggling with your marriage, find marriage mentors. You're struggling with, with, with maybe a health issue, find someone who struggles with health issues. Get yourself a spiritual Sherpa, someone who can encourage you. So Christ's authority over sin, this is the most important aspect of this healing. Uh, Luke 25, 23 says, I keep, uh, I keep hitting it for some reason. It says, which is easier to say, that your sins are forgiven? Or to say, rise up and walk. You see, what Jesus was doing, he was demonstrating his authority over sin and physical healing. And physical healing. We have the Holy Spirit inside of us that, that redeems us, that makes us righteous when we sin. We've got to be aware of that. We've got to continue to move into a state of sanctification, a process of sanctification, which means becoming holy, becoming set apart. Romans 12, 1 says, right? Present yourself as a living sacrifice. That's the goal. What Jesus was doing was he was demonstrating that he had the authority to forgive sin and to manifest physical healing. So when he directed the man, uh, after forgiving his sins, to take an action in faith, to get up and get your mat and go home, he was allowing the man to set his own faith in action. What I will tell you is when you're ministering healing, don't be afraid to ask the person to do something in faith. I, I know just, it's really, it's just, I think it's just a lack of training. I'll tell you the truth. Um, a lot of churches won't deal with healing. Uh, I had a pastor years back and he told it on a, on a Sunday. He said, don't ask me to pray for anybody. I won't go to the hospital. Don't ask me to pray for healing. He pray healing. He said, because what if it doesn't work? How's it going to make me look? And I looked at my wife and I said, we will never come back to this church again. 
will never come back to this church again. That was an extreme case and an honest admission. Not wise, but at least he was honest. But I would venture to say a lot of believers avoid getting involved in praying. They give a little nice prayer. Oh, I hope you feel better. Your little headache goes away. But if you press deep into the commissioning that Jesus gave you through the exousia, through the legal power, you understand that you do have the authority. You have the authority. And that authority doesn't always come with nice, sweet little prayers. You've got to get into the weeds. You've got to be persistent. You've got to get on the roof and rip it if that's what it takes. You see, Mark 3, 5, uh, I will give you an example about asking someone, and you yourself, you've got to take an action in faith. If somebody's like, I can't move my shoulder, and you pray in faith, then you ask them. And it, it, this, that's the beginning of healing. This is a continuation of healing. When you're ministering faith, healing, don't be afraid to ask them to do something. A lot of times we don't because we're afraid, well, what if they can't do it? Then I'm going to look stupid. Or it's going to hurt their feelings. You've got to ask them to put their, their faith into action, their healing into action. Mark 3, 5 says, And when he looked around, he looked around at them with anger, and grieved, being grieved by the hardness of their hearts, he said to the man, this is another, he said, stretch out your hand, and he stretched it out. And his hand was restored as whole as the other. Jesus challenged this man. Put your faith, put your healing into action. Don't leave the way you came. Put your faith into action. I want to challenge you to do that. If you truly believe that you are operating in the authority of God, the commissioning with the power of the Holy Spirit, do not be afraid. Now, don't be crazy. Don't be crazy. Don't ask for cartwheels. And, you know, it's like, well, I was never able to do a cartwheel anyway. Well, where are we at? But what I want to share is we addressed this a couple years ago, when we, a couple years ago, and there was some misunderstanding about, about healing. People thought, well, if I pray and, and, you know, it's like waving a wand and you should be healed. But that's not right. The majority of the time when, when Jesus used healing, it was the word, it's a Greek word, it's therapeo. And that's the word therapy in the English. Jesus did not wave a magic wand. Jesus met with, invested in, and worked with everybody. It took a spiritual and a physical toll on him. So when the woman with the issue of blood simply touched him, what did he say? Virtues left, virtues left me. Don't get discouraged if you're working healing or if you're, you're being healed. That you can't do cartwheels. Or, or, or you have a, a cancer diagnosis and you go to the doctor the next day and they're like, oh, well, well, we're still detecting the tumor. That healing, the therapy, therapy, it takes working. It takes working. And that working is putting that faith in action. Stretch out your hand. Think about going to a therapist. This is all it is. The word means healing, curing. So don't get discouraged if you, when you pray healing over someone. And they're not flipping and, and their neck's like, oh, good. You've manifested the process. Okay? I'll give you another example. Um, the woman with the issue of blood. I said that. And he said to her, daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace and be healed of your affliction. So what did Jesus do? Your faith has made you well. So she's well. But it doesn't end there. Then he says, go in peace. And what? Be healed. It is a process. Therapia. Therapy. It took faith to set it in motion. So when we're ministering healing, or when we come up with the expectation of receiving healing, don't discount the power, the miraculous power of God. Well, I don't feel no better. Well, they don't look no better. It's a process. Now, are there instant, miraculous healings? Yes, they are. But it's all a process. Okay? I just want you to really see that and, and not be afraid to dive in and dig in. 
You've been commissioned to do it. It's important that we get out there and we get it done. So just, just so we know, I just want to make this clear, when it comes to healing, the process. See, her faith made her well. It meant that her bleeding stopped. She'd been bleeding for 12 years. Her faith made her well. When Jesus said, go, what he's doing, take action in the faith of being healed. And then when he says, be healed, what he's saying is, she's been bleeding for 12 years. Physiologically, do you not think that there's some damage? There's some inflammation there, there, to the physical body. The physical body still operates under the physical laws of nature. God created them. God respects them. So you will have to go through the, the physical healing process in the process of therapy. So don't be afraid and don't let that throw you. When, when it's like, well, they're not flipping cartwheels, but, you, but you've activated or, or helped minister to them faith and healing through that faith. Okay? Um, Luke uh, 9, 11, it says, But when the multitudes knew it, they followed him, and he received them and spoke to them about the kingdom of God and healed those who were in need of healing. Look at what happened here. The multitude, remember the word for multitude, aklos, that's the Greek word. It means a confused crowd, a multitude. Why were they confused? Because they didn't know Jesus, right? And they followed him. And it said, and he received them. Jesus is personally investing in these people's lives. A confused multitude of people, people Jesus invested in them. And he spoke to them about what? Not about the magic of healing, about the kingdom of God. He shared the kingdom of God. First the word, then the signs. And what was the sign? And he healed those who were in need of healing. He, dealt, he addressed their spiritual healing and then their physical healing. So, in our obedience, it's so important that, that when we as Christians, that we acknowledge that Christ commands, when he makes the command, that healing comes. That command is his word. That command are the scriptures. Find yourself some healing scriptures. Understand your authority as a believer. To heal and be healed. Um, one last, I got Luke 5.25 and it says, And immediately he rose up before them, took up what he had been lying on, and departed to his own house, glorifying God. What is the most important part of that scripture? It's glorifying God. It's glorifying God. When, when you have been healed, you make sure that you always glorify God. I've had, I've had believers like, whew, I didn't think he was going to do it. Like, no one's more surprised than I. No. Glorify God. Glorify God. When you're ministering healing or deliverance or prophetic, it's all to glorify God. It's all to glorify God. You see, we may not always receive the physical healing in this life, but Christ offers us something greater. Forgiveness of our sins and the gift of eternal life. And just like the paralytic, we must first accept the gift of eternal life. Then we pick up our mats and we glorify God with the living our lives. So I want to wrap this up. And I want you to think about it. I'll give you just a second. And like, how can you live out your life, the life of being spiritually healed? Like, what does that look like, the spiritual healing, the soul care that you've received? It's easy to say the physical healing. You know, I'll, I'll do jumping jack. I'll do something I wasn't before. But I don't want you to neglect the soul care, the inner healing. I just want you to think, if you've been there, what did it look like? And, and, and did, it, did it glorify God is the big question. Or, or if you've ministered healing to people, have you, have you cared first for their soul? For their spiritual well-being. And if we haven't, this is why we equip. This is why we learn. This is why we learn. So that's going to wrap it up for me. I want to pray. I also want to open the altar. It's so important that we know what God says about healing. It's not my opinion. It's no influencer on TikTok. This is what God says. This is what God says.
And I've told you, the Word of God, the Bible is not a salad bar. You cannot pick and choose the pieces that you like and disregard the rest. If he tells us in Mark 16, not if, but he does, that you will lay hands and they will be healed and you've been commissioned. It's, if you've not tried it, God wants you to get in the game. If you're in need of healing, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask that we stand, and, 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 and I'm, I would love for, for anyone to come up to the altar to, to serve as a, as a ministry leader, to minister healing. And I'm not just talking physical healing, I'm talking spiritual healing. If, there's, if your heart's heavy, if you're dealing with, with anything, I invite you to come to the altar and be ministered to. Like that young girl a while back. It would have been easy just to say, oh, that's her, that's her back muscle. But it was, it was more of a soul care issue. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to invite you to, to come up, receive, receive healing. Um, but let me pray for this. Let me pray and we'll dismiss into, into a time of altar ministry. So Lord, Father, we thank you, Father. We praise you. We're so grateful for the eternal goodness of your word. We're so thankful that, that it doesn't take wild tales and, and impulsive speeches to activate the power of your word. Lord, I thank you for, for correcting me and blessing me years ago with that one word ministry. Thank you for showing me the, the, the Kratos power, the outward demonstrable power of the Holy Spirit to heal. And Lord, uh, the, the two people, there's two particular, but this is a prophetic word, so it's always available for everyone who receives it. But this, this is for two people in particular to lay conviction on you and encouragement to pick up the mantle of a one-word ministry. Shalom. So Lord, I pray, I pray that word over this body. I pray shalom. Shalom. I pray the peace of your word, the peace that surpasses all understanding. I pray in this atmosphere of, of, of inner care, inner healing, soul care, that anyone with, with a need would be willing to take that step in faith for healing, whether it's stretching out their hand or going and being well, but that you take the act of faith and you step out. So Lord, I pray peace over this body. I pray a special protection and a provision as these warriors go out to share the word and that they are empowered and understand the, authorities, the believer's authority to exercise the power of deliverance and healing, and prophecy, and all the gifts of the Spirit. But first, they prepare themselves with the Word. So I pray a, a tangible, I pray a tangible manifestation and illustration that when this body begins to dig into the Word, that you will show them the signs that must follow. And they must because you said they do. So Lord, I praise you, I praise you, I praise you. I look forward to the, to the vision you gave me last year where this wall is going to be filled with empty crutches and empty wheelchairs and apparatuses and devices. This wall right there was where the vision occurred. We are equipping a body of healers to begin to, uh, to, begin to manifest that vision into reality. So, Lord, we thank you, we praise you, we honor you. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Thank you.